thanks that you're saying good morning back to me on Facebook as well. Uh, once upon a time, I was in the, uh, the deserts of New Mexico and Texas doing some, some military training. And uh, it was real, real dry out there. It was the summertime. And it was pretty miserably dry and hot. And we were so thirsty for, for some fresh, cool water. The water that we had came from a pipe in the ground that went into this trailer of a cooler. Cooler. Um, and that, in turn, we, we piped into our camelbacks, which came through a hose we put in our mouth. So it had been sitting out for days, it felt like. I um, mean, it was just dusty, and your mouth was, was dusty. And, and it wasn't refreshing like a, a cool glass of water. We longed for, for refreshing water that we could really be sustained. We needed a life source. Uh, and that's what this psalm talks about a little bit, is a life source. So an examination of the, the two paths found here in Psalm 1 will encourage us to live as God would have us live. Um, I'll read it again because it's good. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I'll stop right there. Uh, the, the Psalms, if you're here in the, in the church, you know, there's a, a hymnal um, in the pew in front of you. Um, and the hymnal is a book of, of songs that we can sing, and the, the, that's what the book of Psalms is. It, it's the, the hymnal of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so Psalm 1 here is a prologue. And when you open a book, there's a little piece that briefly describes what the whole book about, is about, and that's what Psalms 1 is. It's a prologue describing the rest of the Psalms. And Psalms 1 here sets out two paths. The path of the blessed person who is in relationship with God and the path of the unrighteous person who is not in relationship with God. And so as, as we journey through this, we're going to see some things. We're going to see um, what the, the person on the righteous path does and does not do. We're going to see what he is like, what that righteous person's life is like and what it's not like. And then we're going to see the end result of those two paths, where those two paths eventually lead. Um, but the, the very first word in this entire book is blessed. And that's a word we like to use here in the South. How are you doing today? Well, I'm blessed and highly favored. And, and so often we, we use the word blessed um, in, in a, a small sense. Oh, well, my day is good today. Um, but what is a biblical sense of being blessed? What does that mean? Being blessed is a deep-seated joy in every circumstance, no matter what circumstance you are in. Um, Philippians 4 uh, talks about um, learning how to be content in every circumstance. Um, how do we do that? Philippians 4 says this, um, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned about me, but you had no need to be worried about me. Now I do have need, but I have learned that in whatever situation I am, to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then comes the verse that is often misquoted, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We can be content in every circumstance, when it is God that we are connected to, when we have that fresh water, when we have the living water of God Almighty. And, and so that is the life that we're all, we're all longing for, right? The, the blessed life of eternal joy. Um, but what about these two paths? Where does that, that imagery come from? It's actually from the beginning of when God made the people of Israel in, uh, what is it, Deuteronomy and in, in Joshua, um, th this idea of a blessing and a curse. Um, Deuteronomy 11, verse 29. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you will set the blessings on Mount Gerizim and the curse on, on Mount Ebal. Excuse me, let me back up, starting in verse 26. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing... If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, 
if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way, the path, the way, that I am commanding you today, and you go after other gods that you have not known that are not myself. And so God set before his people two ways, two paths. And, and that's the, what we're looking at today is these two paths, the, the blessed path and the, and the unrighteous path and that we don't want to be on. And so we're, we're talking about blessedness. That's, that's what you want to be when you're on the good path. Um, we want to be blessed. But the, the first thing we examine in, the, in, the, in verse 1 is what the blessed person does not do, some characteristics of the unrighteous path. Blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat, in the seat of the scoffers. Now, there's three sets of parallels there. You could do a deep dive into those if you like. Um, but there's a couple of things I want to focus on with, with these three things. Uh, walking, standing, and sitting. First, you're, you're walking along with uh, the counsel of the wicked. You're, you're listening to, to, um, to wicked counselors, to bad advice, to wicked advice from people that are not of the church of God. And then you're standing. You're amongst the people of the sinners, people who are openly, they know what the right thing is to do. They know the right thing, and they openly don't do it. They openly go against God. And then you're sitting in the seat you know someone really is a member of something when they're sitting there in the group. You're sitting in the seat of scoffers. Not just the person who, does, who listens to bad advice or uh, openly sins, but even scoffs at any, te- uh, any type of religion or, or connection with God. And, and those are the easy things to think about. Well, I don't do those things, right? Um, but then we go on to, to examine some of the things that the righteous person does do. He delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Delighting and meditating. What is your delight? Uh, I had some Krispy Kreme donuts this morning, and that was a delight uh, to, to, my, to my mouth. Um, is that what the word of God is to you? Um, and then also meditating. When we hear the, the word meditate, we often think of someone sitting and, and meditating and emptying their mind of all thoughts and blanking out and going, mm, mm, and, and blanking out, right? That's not necessarily what the, the imagery of meditating is uh, in the original language. The, the, the word meditate also refers to a cow uh, as he chews, it, chews the cud, right? So in the mornings, the cow go out, cows go out to pasture, and there's the dew on the ground, and that's the good stuff. That's the sweet, sweet grass. And so they eat that, and then it goes into one of their stomachs, and then later on in the day, they regurgitate it to... to Eat it, and, and cows eat real slow, right? Oh. That, that, that's how cows eat. They eat real slow, and they get every ounce of nutrients out of that one meal. And that is what the Word of God is. It is so, so delicious to those who meditate on it. And that's what we're supposed to do, is we take the Scriptures, and we ponder it day in and day out. Um, and, and Joshua um, one, you know, when we think of Joshua chapter one, we think of be strong and courageous. Um, you know, God is giving this mantle of leadership up to Joshua uh, to lead the people into the land, this great strong leader. Uh, but Joshua 1.8, uh, it gives him how to be strong and courageous, how to be a good leader. Joshua 1.8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will ha- have good success. Good success in life, being content in life, only comes when we are meditating on the word of God. So God wants us to live on that righteous path. And we may think, oh, I don't do those evil things, you know, I don't listen to, to the counsel of the wicked, or I'm, I'm not sinning openly. I'm not a bad person, uh, and, I'm, and I certainly don't scoff at religion. But do you? That's the nature of the unrighteous path. But are you doing what's on the righteous path? Are you delighting in the, the word of God? And are you meditating on it day and night? Because you're on one or the other. You're doing one or the other. And chances are, if you're not delighting and meditating, chances are we are listening to the counsel of the wicked. Even that can, that can even be ourselves. 
I don't need to do that today. Me and God are good right now. Um, But chances are we are listening to the counsel of the wicked if we are not delighting in meditating on the word of God. So God wants us to live on that righteous path. And these two verses describe the actions of those living on the righteous path. Isn't it better to walk in the way of the Lord? His love for those who love him is everlasting. So connect with God. That is my encouragement to you today. And then going on to to verse 3, we see the nature of the two paths, the person on each path. What, What do they consist of? The righteous person on the good path is like a tree planted beside streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. We th- when we think prosper, we think a Midas touch, right? Where you touch everything and it's called, everything I do is great. And that's not necessarily what it's talking about. <clears throat> because the Bible clearly says that there will be difficult times. We will face trials and persecutions. Um, but it's going back to the idea of being content and being in God's will above all else. So it's not the Midas touch. <laughs> but the nature of the tree is planted beside streams of water. It yields its fruit in its season and its leaf doesn't wither. Now, as a Christian, I want to have fruit in my life and I want to have leaves in my life. As as a family man and as a caregiver, I want to provide fruit to give nutrients to people that refreshes people. And I want to provide shade that people can relax under and, and, and find strength. And I want to produce that for people, right? So how does the tree produce fruit and leaves? Does he sit there and say, I need to produce fruit really well, and I need to... Does he strain and and try and make it grow? That's not how a tree produces fruit. He produces fruit by tapping into the water. And when that tree digs its root into the water, then the fruit and the leaves, those things that we want, come naturally, organically. Jesus says, I am the living water. Anyone who comes to me will never leave thirsty. Drink of me, and you will find life. And that that offer goes to us all. Tap your roots into the life source of God and Jesus' love for you. And then the the fruit that we want to produce in our life, the good deeds, the good works, the evangelizing, living a good life, being content in your circumstances, that comes naturally when, when all we have is Christ, and that is enough to sustain us. But the wicked are not so. They're dry because they don't have have the roots tapped into a life source. Uh, The wicked are not so. They're like the chaff that the wind drives away. Have you ever seen a tumbleweed, maybe in cartoons, go rolling across the desert? And that's the the imagery there. Um, There is no root. There's no water. And so the wind drives it and it's gone before before you get a chance to really look at it. So they're like the chaff that the wind drives away. And that's all well and good, but the question that I struggle with, um, which seems to be more free? Which life seems to be more free? Certainly the the life planted beside a stream of water is nice, but I personally like to go around and see things, right? The tumbleweed can go here and it can go there and it can go to wherever it wants to. But ultimately, we're going to see that it does not end up in a good place. And so while this, this free life of going wherever you want, having no responsibilities, I don't need to produce fruit, I don't need to produce leaves, I'm here for me, right? Ultimately, that leads to nothing. And so while the, the unrighteous path may look a little bit promising, ultimately it leads to destruction. And so we need to abide in Christ and tap our, our roots into the living water of Christ. And then, thirdly, we see the result of the two paths. Um, Yeah, I missed a Bible verse, but I'll come back to it. The result of the two paths. The wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So the result of the, the unrighteous path is that they will not be in heaven. When we look in Revelation, there's a congregation of righteous people around the throne singing praises to God. And that's the result of, the, of the, the blessed person, the righteous person. But the, the result of the unrighteous person, he is not there in heaven on that last day. Revelation 21 says he is in a place of fire and destruction eternally. 
the, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They will not be in that picture of heaven that we see in Revelation. Um, Matthew 25 talks about sheep and goats. Um, on the last day, on judgment day, he'll, be, he'll, he'll, divide, he'll divide us. Sheep, go over here. Some of you go to heaven. And the goats that have been un- living on the unrighteous path, they go, go into destruction. Uh, Matthew 3 talks about wheat and chaff. They, they were all together at one point, but then you, you, you sort the wheat and you sort the chaff, and the chaff drives away, and only the good wheat remains. And so the, the person that is currently living on the unrighteous path will not be among those clothed in white that is singing the songs of God around his throne. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Oh, what a comfort. The Lord knows the way or the path of the righteous. Um, and, and there's a better way of, of looking at the word know. Um, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. It could also be translated as the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Uh, my wife and I like to watch uh, the, the show NCIS. And at one point, the, the heroes are in the Middle East chasing the bad guys. And uh, they come into an ambush. And there's only three or four of the good guys and a bunch of the bad guys, and so they're overwhelmed, and they are hiding behind the car doors, and Gibbs calls in a, a phone call, and he's hiding, and they're hiding, and in comes an attack helicopter, right? Providing overwatch, providing overwatch, taking care of the weaker people. And that's what God does for us. We are very, very weak. We are very weak, but God provides overwatch. He watches over. He guards our path. He knows the way of the righteous. He will take care of you. Romans 8. Great, great passage. Romans 8. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us these things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who then shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ? Will tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, yes, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The day is coming. God loves you so much. The day is coming like a thief in the night, and it's going to show what path we are on. So which path are you on, as, as we've seen in, these, um, seen in this passage? Are you on the righteous path, where God loves you and he wants to, to keep you safe, or are you on the unrighteous path, um, living in sin or, or listening to the counsel of the wicked or scoffing at religion? But if you are on the righteous path, please know God cares about you so much. And if you're on the unrighteous path, God cares about you. And he wants you to be on his righteous path. That's where he wants you to be. And he wants to cover you. He wants to cover you with his arms uh, of strength and, and wrap his loving arms around you. That's what he wants. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And we are all in need of, of repentance and turning to Christ. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, even me, pastors, singers, everyone has fallen short and needs to repent of our sins. At one point, we are all on on the unrighteous path. And how do we get to that blessed path? How do we get to the righteous path? The only way to remain or get onto God's righteous path, not what we think is righteous, is to be in Christ. How? By preaching the gospel to yourself daily, as Paul David Tripp says. Preachers preach the gospel to ourselves daily.
Repent of your sins daily. Turn to Christ daily. Rejoice in the fact that God raised Christ up from the dead daily. And that's the blessed path. That is when God watches over you. Because God will, even if you haven't repented in a long time, God will still love to hear from you. So in our examination of Psalm 1, we have discovered that the only way to live as God would have us live on the righteous path is to remain in Christ. We've seen um, the things that the righteous person does and does not do. We've seen the nature of the, the righteous person and the unrighteous person. And we see the end goal, the end result of those two paths. So turn to Christ. Turn to Christ today. Um, there's a Psalms that I love to close with. It's Psalms 34. And it's the, a cry that sinner and saint alike can, can call upon the Lord with. Um, for, for the saint that has been living in sin for some time or even just today needs to repent and, and come back to Christ and needs to look at that, that end goal that we have in heaven. Or for the sinner that has never turned to Christ, you can, you can also say this. I will bless God at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought out the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angels of the Lord encamped around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for your word that speaks life, that offers life, that sets so clearly the, the boundaries that you have set around the, the giving of life. Uh, draw us all, Lord, into your loving embrace. Uh, draw us onto your righteous path. Teach us your ways. Uh, keep us humble before you. May the cross of Christ always be enough for us. May we find our contentment and our joy and our blessedness in you alone. We love you. It's in Christ's holy name I pray. Amen.